frustrated because it like was difficult to, to get started. I had this great idea in my head, like you obviously always have, or, or your customer had, customers have that for you, um, and presented to you in, in the form of a like 500 page specification book. And so I had this idea in my head and, and I didn't really know how to systematically start coding to actually solve the problem. And it was very hard, but I did it somehow and, and kept doing it. But then in 2005, um, in 2005, during a, a vacation in Ireland, um, I, I had an idea. I had to do it differently. And well, that was bad for my wife, or not then yet my wife. But, um, she had to do all those hiking trips alone almost. And I sat there and, and thought about like software architecture, doing it like differently doing it in a more systematic way. Um, at least I thought so. And, and since then, this, this idea of mine has evolved, and I'm now a software architecture consulting, clean code consulting, whereas before I was more like a technology guy. Um, but I've switched. I've switched to this side, to the more theoretical and conceptual side of software development, because I think this is still too hard. Software development is, is difficult because of all the details, but we make it even more difficult by not really systematically thinking about software before actually writing any code. So to give you an example, here's a, an architecture kata. Very simple specification. Read it. And you're sure proficient enough in, in one framework or the other um, so that you would have an idea how to actually implement this, right? It should be a simple web-based application for sending long tweets. Maybe TweetDeck can't do that. Maybe it can, but nevertheless, just for the sake of the exercise, we want to do it ourselves. That's a nice little exercise. Maybe. How to set up an application, a service, a program, however you want to name it, um, how to do that, like starting from this specification? Take me as the customer, maybe I want to give you some money. Um, we could like start in estimating now how much would that cost? Would that cost like $1,000 or 10000 or 50,000 pounds? I don't know. But that's not the point here. I want to know how would you actually start this project? What would you do as a software developer? Not as a product owner, but as a software developer. Research Twitter's API. Research Twitter's API, yes. But why? So you can figure out if you communicate with Twitter. Right, but why? I assume you have to communicate with Twitter. That's more sense to Okay, he says you would research the Twitter API because he kind of assumes we have to use the Twitter API. Okay, how would you document that? How would you tell me as a customer, how would you tell your fellow developers that this is necessary, that this is an aspect of the solution? How would you do that? Does someone want to come up here to the flip chart, a white sheet of paper, so you can do whatever you want to actually design this software right from the start? Clean slate. Isn't that what you want? Greenfield project. There's nothing there yet. How would you do that? How would you fill this sheet of paper? Here's a pen. You have an approach. You can show us you actually are convinced, leads you from this in a straight way to code. Okay, not 
so many people eager to come up from you. Who's using UML in his day-to-day -day practice to not document software after the fact, but to actually design software before the code is there? Who's using UML? Okay, sure. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven out of what? 50 something? So it's roughly 10%, give or take. Okay, that's the usual result of such a poll. It's 10% of developers who are actively using UML, and 90% are not. Why is that after 15 years? Why is that? Why, why aren't you using UML? It's too cumbersome? I can understand that. Yes, it's so much, so many diagrams. Where to start? Right, and that's the second point. What's the method? What's actually the way through this maze of diagrams of UML to take to get from specifications like that to code? I don't know. I've tried hard and read a couple of UML books. Yes, some are trying more, some less to convey such a method. Sorry, I have to say, maybe I'm just an average developer. I didn't get it. Didn't work for me. So I can't tell you all, like the whole method I've come up since then with, um, but I can give you a glimpse, like the first step, like the big picture, a very coarse-brained uh, tool to actually design, start designing software, which was very, very helpful for me in the past, past years. Okay, and this tool is an app. It starts with a small piece of paper. Because if you start with a large whiteboard, you get into so much detail, so very fast. Don't. Try to stay on a high level of abstraction. We are so much obsessed, so obsessed with detail. And I know Bob tells us, yes, programming is about detail. And he's right. Yes, in the end, we have to solve all the details of the Twitter API, whatever, OAuth, authentication, whatever. Uh, and you need to really be an expert in thousands of APIs if you want to do it right. But that's the end. That's like one end of the spectrum. Before you get there, you have to design your software. You have to have an idea of the overall approach of your software, how it's setting out to solve the problem. Okay, how do you do that? How do you get to the point that you can then say, here's where I have to use the Twitter API, here's where I have to use whatever else. How do you get from here to there? That's a difficulty, I guess. Okay, so now I'm saying, start out with just a cross grain picture. Just take like this, a napkin or a single sheet of flip chart paper and draw on that. Why draw? That's the same as Simon Brown is saying. Draw software. Visualize software because then it's so much easier to communicate with your fellow colleagues, with your fellow programmers, developers about your thinking, about your own mental model. Otherwise, there will be loss. You're thinking something, you are speaking, talking about what you're thinking, and then what reaches the other guy? You don't know. Is that the same what he's now thinking about this stuff? Maybe, maybe not. If you have something not written, because that needs to be much more interpretive, again, but drawn on a piece of paper in a very <coughs> lightweight location, which doesn't get in the way of designing the software, then it's much easier to move forward very fast. Okay, so that's the first tool you should buy, like in large amounts, uh, plus a pen, a, a really good architect pen. And then you start like this, maybe. That's the question. Is that what you would do? Like say, OK, we have to build this Twitter service. Uh, yes, I know one thing. It's a multi-tier or multi-layer application. That's certainly not wrong, right? It has to have several layers. We have to separate those concerns of presentation and business logic and data access something or API access, the Twitter API. 
Well, that's not wrong, but it won't work. We are clinging too much to this multi-layer design pattern because it doesn't scale. That's wrong about it. It doesn't scale. It's not bad. It's not really bad. The, the, the best thing that this pattern brought us is this separation of responsibilities. It's a different responsibility to present something to interact with the user than accessing data on, on a hard disk or communicating with some cloud service than doing some, well, domain logic calculations, whatever. That's all different stuff, and we should put the stuff in different modules, whatever that module is. But think of modularization. Okay, uh -huh. stuff has to be kept apart so it can evolve separately. That's a good idea. Well, great, thanks. Layer design uh, pattern. But there's something wrong with this design pattern. <coughs> Do you know what layers are? Have you heard about the OZ7 layers of communication? Are those layers the same? No, why not? You're shaking your head, why not? Well, for this particular project, we don't necessarily have these types of layers. Okay, he's, he's saying, well, maybe for this project, we don't have these types of layers. Maybe there's no data access. Maybe there's just Twitter communication. Um, but I ask how, how this layered model the software layers is different from the OZ communication layer model. Very fundamental. In the OZ set layer model, on the bottom, what's there? Like hardware? Hardware for communication, right? What's on the next layer on top of that? Fine. Data? Data? Data link. Data link. Okay. So it's like this. this a little bit advanced communication. They put something on top of the hardware. So it's very, very basic communication API to use the hardware. What's on top of that? Transport, okay. That's also communication on a slightly higher level of abstraction, right? What's on top of that? Network, what's on top of that? <laughs> okay, this, okay, this is not a test. <laughs> so, <laughs> what's the top layer? <coughs> Any idea? Application. Like application, okay. So application is about communication. Below that somewhere is maybe objects communicating. Below that is a network, transport, whatever. So it's seven layers of communication, right? <coughs> All layers are doing the same. All layers are doing the same, but each layer, each higher layer, on a higher level of abstraction. Like maybe below there, it's, it's 20 API calls, the second layer, because the first layer is the, the hardware. And then on top, on the top layer, maybe it's just one API call. Very abstract. Send method or send object from A to B. That's it. Establish communication channel, whatever, and serialize, deserialize, da 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 and so on, and down there it's, it's 20 API calls. So it's all the same, each layer is doing the same, it's communication on a high level of abstraction. Now back to the design pattern here. What is this layer doing here? It's doing data access. Great, okay, that's the most basic layer. What's it doing, what, what's the next level layer above that doing? Is that doing data access on a higher level of abstraction? No, Pardon? it's it's different. What is what is the next layer doing on top of that? It's visualizing of data. It's not manipulating it. It's not a high level data access API, but it's something different. Presentation is different from calculation and business logic from data access. Those layers are doing different things. So that's not the same thing as the OZ layer are doing. That's why I think this is kind of misleading. It, it kind of suggests uh, there's a rising level of abstraction, but it's not. It's not layers of virtual machines on top of each other. 
That's what Adelson and Sussman call strata, that stratified design. This is just layers, but not the same layers as we knew before. So that makes it difficult. It's, let me, let me say that like a little bit polemic. It's a lie. And this is why it's so difficult to build good software on that, on top of that. Because starting with a lie never leads you really anywhere, right? OK. So then, next. This is not bad for very, very simple things to just like separate some responsibilities. But then you're moving from here to there. Or you want not this maybe a desktop software, but you want something that scales, that's, that has internet reach, that works on several machines because scalability, performance, security, whatever requires you to distribute your, your logic, presentation logic, business logic, and so on. So you have different machines there. OK, there's a desktop machine here, or maybe the front end machine. It can be a web server producing HTML. There's a business logic server here. There's a data access logic server there, where, where your SQL server, Oracle, whatever, RDBMS is running. OK, great. Then my question is, when the presentation logic, when the HTML server delivers JavaScript to the client, which contains validation, what is the validation? Is the validation presentation logic? Is the validation business logic? Is the validation data access logic? It's what? It's business logic, right? So on the presentation tier, it's running business logic. That's strange. OK. On the other side, you have your RDBMS. You're using store procedures. Those store procedures are calculating some averages, sums, max, whatever you like. Some stats. What is that? That's your data, data tier. And within the data tier is running store procedure to do all those calculations. What kind of logic is that? It's business, it's business logic. OK, so it's business logic running here in the data access or data tier. It's business logic running here and it's business logic running here. That kind of is the mismatch with this, with this scheme, I would say. It doesn't fit. This distribution of layers across tiers, across devices, because you can't really visualize or think that whatever was here, business logic, is now here. It's tainting, it's poisoning the presentation purpose. This is what, for my taste, makes this difficult. This is why for developers, again and again, feel uneasy once they scale the multi-layer model. OK, we have to do that. Yes, we're using this stop procedure, but we don't know how to, like, how to call it, how to visualize it, how to argue for doing that. Is that OK to do? OK, we have to do it. It's for performance, yes. But is that right? Better don't tell anybody. OK. Good. So starting out with this approach, taking the, the specification I just showed and trying to get into designing the software using the layout or NTM model or design pattern doesn't really help. It's like a quick step, but it, it doesn't scale. It doesn't lead you really deep. Now you might say, well, Ralph, um, maybe you haven't slept yet slept the, the past five, six, ten years. Um, there are other developments like these. Have you heard about them? Clean architecture, onion architecture, hexagonal, uh, ports and adapters architecture, or Russ Miles, the life preserver architecture. Or maybe I shouldn't say it's all architecture, it's, it's like models. That's all nice and well. OK, yes, they are there. And they are kind of helpful, yes, OK. But still, something is amiss to me. Because even though it might be right to say, let's put the domain model right here in the middle so it's independent, dependencies point from the outside to the inside, OK? 
Okay, so we can check that maybe even with a tool um, by looking at the code base and see whether a, a domain service is just referencing the domain model and not the other way around. Okay, that's not bad. As long as you are really thinking in terms of dependencies, this might help. I'm advocating not thinking in terms of dependencies anymore. I won't be able to tell you that all in 90 minutes today. Um, but as long as you're into dependencies, that's great, good. But how does it help? Does it actually help to draw this clean architecture? What is the method? Has anybody read the article about the clean architecture method? How to use it to solve a specification problem? I haven't read the article. Sorry. I've seen here and there some examples, mostly consisting of code, but not showing any like roadmap, not showing steps on a way how to move from here from the specification in a stepwise manner <coughs> towards code, towards a level of abstraction and detail so I can actually start coding. So that leaves me kind of dissatisfied. I'm sorry. As, as good as those approaches are, that's great. And you'll recognize, when I continue, you'll recognize parts from that in, in my approach. But I point out where I differ and why that's important for me. OK, here's what I recommend. First, and this is a method, right? So, so write down those, grab a sheet of paper, use a napkin grab a pen, then draw a circle. It's as easy as that. And you're halfway done. You can send off your, your boss, say, OK, I'm designing the software. I just started. That's all good and wait. Well, come back later. I'll tell you. OK, why is that important? I think it's important. And this is pretty close to UML, too. So when you go home, you can tell your boss, well, I, I also heard this session about UML. You'll like it. Okay, this is, this is important because it puts a boundary on the paper. It manifests a boundary between the system, whatever you need to write, and the environment. Whatever you don't need to write, whatever is there. You have to clearly delineate the system. You have to have, draw a boundary, say, Within this, that's my system, my responsibility. That's my responsibility. This is the environment. This is, so to speak, not my responsibility. <coughs> so whatever goes wrong here, it's not my fault. Whatever goes wrong here, sure, it's my fault. No, I'm just kidding. It's very, very, very important to, to draw this boundary because how many, like, how many parts to the system are now there? This is now interesting. How many parts into how many aspects have I divided the empty sheet of paper now? Three. Three. That's right. Which are they? Environment, the and system, and the interactions between the system. Okay. Environment, yes. System. And you say interactions with the environment. I call that the membrane. See, this, this line here is the third part of the page. <coughs> so this is, this is a start for each and every software. You're writing the next Twitter, draw a circle. You're writing the next word processor that's taking over the world. Start with a circle. You're writing whatever, the desktop calculator, the long tweet service, start with a circle. It's very important. Because then we can ask questions. We can ask questions about what's in the environment. What is there? Is there an Oracle server we need to communicate with? Is there a some hardware device we need to use? Is there um, some platform? some database we need to use or 
we wish suggest to use? All those questions, we'll get into that a little bit deeper on the following slides. Okay, suddenly, you can ask all those questions. That's one, one advantage of, of this, your system versus the environment. Okay, the second is, and this is missing, this is missing from the layered architecture or empty architecture, and this is also, I'd say, missing from the cream and onion and whatever architecture. It's this. It's not just one circle. It circles all the way down. So we have to view software not as just like one system, draw one circle, determine the environment, and you're set and start with the components maybe, or classes, or whatever you like. No. Ask yourself which subsystems are there within the system. And which subsystems, sub-subsystems. So we have nested systems. That's obviously true for whatever is out there as, in terms of larger software, as, as a fact. But do we design that actively? Are we able to visualize that? That's a question. And I guess it's hard. It's very hard. But it can be so simple. So it circles all the way down. Start, as, start with a circle. And no, this might not be the last circle you're drawing. This is the overall system. This is the whole system. But this whole system might be split into smaller systems. Today I'm going to talk about like, two different categories of smaller systems, and tomorrow the workshop um, will, will dig deeper into one of those categories. Okay, so it circles all the way down, and I'll show you how to split up those circles. Now let's get a bit more systematic. It's one step to divide the, the paper into two very broad categories of, of stuff whatever is within the system and whatever is outside the system. And now, outside the system, we have to differentiate between two different aspects. The first aspect is, who's going to use the system? The first questions you need to ask, the first questions whatever product owner is there needs to ask is, who's using the system? What kind of roles are out there? It's maybe Peter, Paul, and Mary, but maybe Peter, Paul, and Mary are pretty much doing the same. That's fine, so it's one role. Maybe Peter, Paul, and Mary are doing different things. Maybe Peter is the manager, and Paul is, is some admin, and Mary is the clerk. So they have certainly different requirements for, those, for the system. And we should log them differently. We should log them separately. So asking who is using the system is the first step to decompose the specification. Don't try to decompose the specification along technical lines at first. Try to decompose it along the, the human lines. Who is using the system? Who is benefiting from the system? Who is controlling the system? The symbol I'm using here, this denotes the dependency. <coughs> I'm not using the arrow as a dependency symbol because the arrow is reserved for a very different purpose in my drawings, as we'll, as we'll see. Um, I'm using this symbol here. It says, okay, this, this woman here, maybe Mary, Mary is depending, is using, is controlling the system. Paul is depending on the system, is using the system, is controlling the system, is triggering something in the, within the system. As is um, Peter here, as is, whoa, look at this, some other system. Some other system might play a role within the environment of our system under development. Or here, this is like an anonymous system, there's a very specific system, SAP. Well, not that I'm recommending to use as a P, I don't know. Um, but still, it's certainly the case in, in many scenarios. SAP using another system. In, in whatever way. We have to think about that later, but first, list 
whoever is using our system. That's the first breakdown. Talk about, talk about the specification, the requirements with the product owner in that way. He can relate to that. Product owners, they have a concept of, of users and actors and roles. That's the one side. And you were talking about the other side. That's the next we have to think about. We have to think about what kind of things is our system going to use? What's the system depending on? Is the system depending on some hardware it's going to drive? Is it depending on some software product like an RDBMS? Which kind of product then? Or technology, a paradigm, and so on. Is it depending on some other system? Maybe we are writing the system. And see, it's two circles here already. I said it circles all the way down. Or some other hardware or some cloud API like Patton up here or Twitter. So the first step is to delineate the system and then collect whoever is using the system and what the system is using itself, what it's depending on. That's the first step. Very easy. Very, very lightweight notation. A circle, yes, we can remember that. It's this dependency symbol here. If you like, use an arrow, but you'll regret it. You'll regret it very soon. Yes. Um, use those symbols here. You can use stick figures if you like to denote who's actually using the system. That's the actors. And what the system is using itself as resources. <coughs> As you can see, there's a dividing line here. There's two sides to a system. One side describes who's using the system. One side describes what the system is using itself. This is not clear in clean architecture, onion architecture, or even parts of the others. There's no direction of communication. But there is a direction, always. And I think it's important. It's important to distinguish between, for example, oops, whether SAP is used by the system or whether, whether it's the other way around. That's important. I'd say people are using the system but never are used by the system. Better that way. Okay, but there is a dividing line here. How do we draw it? It's not important to draw the actors on the left side and the resources on the right side. Usually I do that. You're not confined to that. So you can draw a resource on the left side. More importantly, you, you should show the dependency with this symbol here like this. Okay, be very careful. Resources are used by the system. Actors use the system. And now there's the arrow coming into the picture. I, I really want to distinguish between two kind, of, uh, two kind of relationships. One relationship is dependency. The arrows show what, how the data flows. Data flows in both directions. But still, it's different how the data flows because on the left side with the actors, data flow is usually initiated by the actor. <coughs> And the data flow on the right side usually is initiated by the system. I think it's, it's important to have this asymmetric relationship clear. OK, so it's a whole system. We gathered, we compiled who's using it. We compiled on a very high level <coughs> abstraction who the system is using itself. You want to do that for the initial scenario? There's a system, and it's the long tweet, long tweet service. What kind of actors do we have? User who's using the actor system. Okay, we have the the user. Is there a special name? Could we? Is that the the Twitterer or the 
tweet sender or just the user. Okay, for now it's the user. Is there another actor in this scenario? Is one named in the specification? Can we imagine one we could talk with the customer about? Twitter. Fine? Twitter. Twitter. Is Twitter a user of our system? I don't think so. The user reading the tweet. Fine? The user reading the tweet. The user reading the tweet. Interesting. Is, is the user reading the tweet using our system? Yes, he is. So we have one user who, that's not the one you saw it. Oh, the one writing it. That's writing it. Okay, let's call him the writer. And there's another user, that's the reader, right? So it's good we think about this. Who else might be using the system? So where would I? Where would I use the, oh, how would I become a reader? <coughs> I go to Twitter, and within the tweet I'm reading, there's a link, I click on it, and then, then I'm redirected to a page produced by our system. So nothing more to do. It's transparent to me, I guess. So that's very easy, the, the writer, on the other hand, is the writer always just writing? He calls up this page and, and just types in his tweet and that's it? You might have some kind of application that sits between the writer and the service to abstract for that. Okay. There might be a third party application, that might not be your application. Okay, there might be a third party application, but I'm saying, no, we want to write this the whole service. Thing. The whole experience is ours. We want to provide the service online. You go to longtweet.com and enter your tweet and it gets shortened and sent right away. Or you have a desktop application, some, some app you can download from some app store. I think this guy is working in two modes. Hopefully mostly in the mode of a writer. He's sending tweets. But then maybe, <coughs> at least once, he has to be in a different mode. He has to register as a user. He has to, to enter his credentials, maybe his, his Twitter name, whatever. I'm not sure yet. We have to dig deeper into the Twitter API, right? How is this working? But I guess we should at least document our uncertainty here by saying hmm, there's not only the writer but also the admin maybe or the or the or the user as in user log on registration stuff like that hmm. see what we are talking about right now is domain specific oh, not domain specific but domain language ubiquitous language as in domain group design we're talking about terms within the domain of sending tweets, sending long tweets. Okay, so there's the user. He has to sign up, log in, whatever. Then he, the same person, Ralph or Peter, Paul and Mary, then he switches his hat, becomes a writer, sends tweets. And then on, at the other end, there's Mary looking at, at her <coughs> timeline in Twitter and seeing, oh, there's a tweet clicking on the link and is redirected to a page we could do. Okay? Great. On the other side, what about resources? See? Let's see the vision here. What about this side? We absolutely have Twitter. There is Twitter, yes. One way or the other. We need to interface with or communicate with Twitter. We need to send the tweet. I don't know how, but there's certainly some kind of API for Java, C Sharp, Ruby, whatever. Yeah. Maybe a REST API. Right? A URL shortener, right. Maybe Bitly, maybe Tiny URL, maybe whatever. Mm -hmm. 
in, in Tuna provides none, right? But is that the point for us? I don't know. We have to, we have to check. Fine, that was. Web framework. Web framework. Web, what? Web framework. And web, web, web framework? Okay. <coughs> is that a resource? Resource is mostly hardware of one kind or the other, like a hard disk, a communication link, um, a, a webcam, a scanner, a printer. That's what a resource is. Something to use with an API, but not the runtime. Yes, you're right. We have to talk about the runtime. What kind of stack are we using here? But let's wait for that. So this is the first round, great. We have separated inside from outside. We don't have a clue what we have to do on the inside, but we know now something more about the outside. What can we now do already? What does this mean for our development effort? Right now, if we, want to, if we wanted to start this project right now, how would we, we be now enlightened? Okay, the very important term he's using is we know what to research. We know where our uncertainty is. We know where risk might lie, may lie. So we need to ask, is there someone on our team who is familiar with the Twitter API? Possibly not. Is someone familiar with the URL shortener? We need to research on his name. That's right. Okay. What about those guys here up front? How do they inform our development effort? We need to know how to interact with them, which means they, yeah, you could call them stakeholders. Yes, they certainly have an opinion about what we deliver. We can show that to them, to a writer. Is this usability you want? Okay, and what you're hinting at is there's an API working here too. We need to decide which API to use. Maybe it's WPF, maybe it's WinForms, maybe it's JavaFX, is that right? Okay, so maybe it's some, some web MVC and API. Right, what else? See, that's always the most difficult thing, the thing, most difficult thing to think about for developers. Not that technology, that was easy, no? Oh, technology, yes, research, research, use technology, right. What direction the data flows from each individual? Yes, what direction data flows? Okay, mostly from here to there, and then sometimes from here to there, I guess. But it's always initiated by an actor. I mean, we get we get informed as to how to talk to the product. This is a partitioning of the specification of the overall scope. This is a hint at to how, how to do this in an agile manner. We can now ask, do you want to start with this writer rule? Should we start with some reader functionality first? Or do you want to have the login experience hammered out at the beginning? This is about iterations. It's about increments. The overall application, of course, is an increment, like the, the maximum increment, increment, delivering all within like six months. Great, a, a long time. What to deliver in a shorter time frame? Not everything, but something, just a part of the, the overall requirements. Which part? Not a horizontal part. We now know how to communicate <coughs> with Twitter. That's pretty, not very interesting for, for the product owner. But something he can relate to, some of the stakeholders can relate to. So we can deliver something for this stakeholder, maybe all the reader functionality, or maybe all the writer functionality, or maybe some of the writer <coughs> functionality and some of the reader functionality. Now we can talk about this. It's not just an amorphous whole, it's structured. Structured in a way the product owner can relate to. 
That's the point. So this is the first step in the direction of agility. The first step, decomposing the overall scope. Okay, so this is the system, but there's like a, a, a white spot. We have to talk about something here, and that's what's within the system. That is the domain. And that's like in uh, clean architecture, onion architecture, the, the core of the system is the domain. That's like, what is the core of this system? How would you describe the domain? Fine. What kind of system? Separate system? No. Have you, do you have a, like a tweet? Can you say something in 140 characters describing the domain? Just the domain. It's difficult, I know. It's something you would say to, to, uh, to an executive in the elevator. It's not an elevator pitch, but a Twitter pitch. 140 characters, very short. This is what we want to build. We don't need to invent it. I almost wrote it down on the first slide. <coughs> Okay, it sends tweets to Twitter, and if they are longer than 140 characters, it shorts them. Okay. Yeah, that's more than 140 characters, I guess, but still, no. Um, still, it's, it's pretty concise. Right. Okay, that's the domain. The domain, yes, it includes Twitter, but all the other things, we don't know. We don't know anything about infrastructure here and there. We don't know about infrastructure here. The, the domain doesn't include any information about technological detail. That's the point of the domain. That's the point of the, of the domain model right in the middle of the clean architecture. It's so isolated from all those technological details. <coughs> okay, but, but I'm not dividing up the domain anymore. The domain fills out like everything within the circle. It's easy to draw to draw in a different manner. So that's why I usually start like this. This is my system, and to be always very clear what the system is about, is I draw another circle in there for the domain. Sometimes I fill it out like this, sometimes not. And this is also the reason why I call this a software cell. It looks like a cell, right? Like a biological cell. And this analogy goes further. This is a cell. It's, it has a core. The core is the most important part of it. That's where the, the real stuff is happening. It is a membrane. The membrane isolates whatever's in there from the environment to provide a stable internal environment. That's the point about life. Life started in very small spheres. Maybe, maybe in very cold regions, because their chemical reactions are slower, and those spheres, which somehow got built, are less prone to be destroyed by heat. But nevertheless, there was a sphere, and the sphere, whatever built this, the, the, the surface of the sphere, the membrane, divided an inner milieu from the outside. So within the sphere, something could happen in a more stable manner than on the outside. That was, it was protected. That's the purpose of the membrane here. And we'll dive into that in a moment. OK, so this is a more, more um, schematic view. <coughs> one line for the domain, and a circle in the middle for uh, one line for the membrane and one circle for the, for the domain. But if we, want, if we look closer, if we zoom into the membrane, we see it's structured. The membrane actually consists of several parts. Because 
yes, in the end, we have to ask ourselves, how do we actually do this here? There's some business logic in this core. Yeah, we have an idea of what that means. But, but this, this symbol here, the, the line, well, what does it mean? OK, this membrane line stands for at least those two actually layers. And if we zoom in even further, it looks like this. OK, so there's an actor. An actor communicates with our system through some API, JavaFX, um, WinForms, WPF, whatever. This API is wrapped, and that's a very important point, it's always wrapped by some kind of adapter. And this adapter, who's wrapping the API for the communication with an actor, I call portal. If you like, choose another term. Um, worked for me pretty well. So it's an adapter. We are back to the hexagonal architecture. Yes, it's adapters on the outside. And this adapter I call portal because someone is entering the system through this portal. And then there's mapping because this API is used by the portal and delivers data, which is coming in from the environment, or which is sent to the environment, back to the actor, um, in some certain format. So there's a view model, or a portal model, of data, which is depending on the API. What could that be? If you're thinking about like a console application running in some terminal window, it could be just strings. All data is represented as strings. Whatever gets input, it's represented as strings. That's the very, very, very basic view model the portal gets from the API or sends, from, uh, sends to the API. But our domain doesn't want to deal with strings. People enter numbers and dates and whatever, or, or several of those data. The domain wants to deal with data on a higher level of abstraction. That's what this mapping is doing. It maps the raw view model to some high level model for the domain, which is called domain model. If this is really the same as Eric Evans, um, like Eric Evans means when he says, Domain driven design and the domain object model. Okay, we can talk about that later. But for now, let's distinguish those models. So here's a membrane, here's a membrane. We are talking to this guy over here. There's an API, there's an adapter, and over here, there's a mapping between the domain model and the view model. There's also a mapping taking place. And those layers, let me say layer here, isolate the domain from the environment. There's three layers, like with our skin. It's several layers of skin. It's not just one chunk of meat. No, actually the, the meat is beneath the skin. And the skin consists of several layers, epidermis and, and several others. Um, it's the same here. This is like the skin. And it has an outer layer of API, an inner layer of an adapter, here it's a portal, and another inner layer of a, of a mapping. And then it's the real meat of the application, the domain. That's where the portal is. See, wherever the, the actor is communicating with the system, that's done through the portal. That's my term for the, for the adapter at that side, on that side. OK? So wherever any actor is communicating with the system, a portal needs to be set up. And what is a portal in terms of code? 
because I want to give you some guidance as to how to structure your code already. Can you imagine what a portal would be, this adapter isolating this API? It's an interface. Pardon? An interface. An interface, yes. So the implementation would be a class. Right. So you have a class for at least one class for each portal here. And if we go back, you very likely have another class to do the mapping. In very simple applications, maybe mapping and portal will go together, but I recommend keep them separate. So it's already three classes, right? One class for the portal, one class for the mapping, one class for the domain. It's a very natural, very formal dissection of your program, the very basic anatomy of your software. There's no thinking, it's mechanic. I like it. Because it lets me focus on what's in there. I get guided to there needs to be a portal. Okay. That was easy. Now I can think about the difficult stuff, how to actually do the portal. What's the API between the, the portal and the domain? Okay, so that's the actor side. On the other side, it's the same. The domain communicates with a resource through an API, which it shouldn't see. It's encapsulated by a provider, another adapter, the adapter outward facing or, or resource facing adapter. The provider encapsulates the API, works with the, well, resource model or, or persistence model, if you like, so there's API here again. Here we have the um, provider. And there's some mapping going on over there. And it's again the domain model versus um, the, let's call it PM like persistence model. What could that be? Maybe we are talking to MongoDB here. That's MongoDB. Some MongoDB API. MongoDB API is not visible to the domain, of course. Okay, the API. What's the persistence model of MongoDB? Any idea? Any experience? Eventually consistent. Fine. Eventually consistent. Eventually consistent. Eventual consistency, yeah, but that's, uh, that's not the, the, the data model. Uh, document. document. Fine. Documents. Right, it's documents, and those documents get described using hierarchy of reason um, data structures. Okay, so it's reason. The domain doesn't want to work with reason or JSON or something like that. It wants to work with a domain model, domain data model. So some mapping has to take place. This is taking place here. here. That's providers, providers encapsulating the communication of the system with the environment, the resource side of the whole thing. If you like, sometimes to, to make it like more, more tangible for you, you can change this picture, which now looks like this again, very quickly. Okay, so it's two sides, two sides like this. Which still, even though I say this is asymmetric because there's control going in here, there's control flowing out there, it looks pretty symmetric because of the circle. I could draw a, a resource over there, it's still okay. So if you want to be more clear about the asymmetric, asymmetric nature of those relationships, we can draw it like this. Now it's really a life preserver. Now the resources sit in the middle, uh, like this. This is more like we, we as uh, organisms are built. Can you imagine? This is not for the fainter part. This is skin out there, right? Someone pressing on my skin, hitting me in the head. This is our skin. What's this? Not the brain, fine, intestines, right. 
that's going in here, and it's coming out the other side. And it's all in contact with the environment. So our, our overall surface is not just skin, it's also on the inside, the intestines, that surface in contact with the environment. In a whole different way, yes, it's asymmetric. Outside is different compared to inside. You can draw it like, like this. I don't draw it like this very often, just to tell you, uh, or to make it more clear here, because that's not very handy, as you will see in a minute. It doesn't get scale, the, the, this effect, depiction doesn't scale. One word about the communication. In the layered model, you remember, layers not only separate responsibilities, like presentation layer, or logic, business logic, <coughs> data access logic, also those layers are supposed to show you how the dependencies are ordered or directed. They're going from a top layer to a bottom layer. Maybe even, though, even this way, but mostly it's like this. Okay? My question always was, why should I call the business logic if the business logic doesn't do anything? I just want to get data from the data access. Okay, you just have to do it because it's a layer model. Bullshit. Okay, this one here is different. The software cell. The software cell does not know dependencies. There's no dependencies in there. This is the second trait. Um, making it different from the clean architecture and onion architecture and so on. There's no dependencies. This portal does not know the domain. The domain does not know the provider. The provider does not know any portal and the other way around. There's no <coughs> functional dependencies. That's a very important message. We have to think about how to implement that. Kind of strange, right? The presentation logic, not having a reference to some business logic calling some functions to get calculations done. No. But still it works. But I find it very important because functional dependencies, which are all over the place in your code bases, functional dependencies are the, the worst thing we can think of. It's like worse than the null, which was a billion dollar mistake according to Tony Hawk. Functional dependencies lead to legacy systems, lead to, lead to brownfield code, whatever, technical debt. Functional dependencies, bad. Okay, that's why there's no dependencies here, but just data flow. Can't dig really into that right now, how the data flow is set up. Um, maybe some other time. Okay, this now is the anatomy of a single software cell. There's an outside and there's an inside. There's certain relationships between outside and inside, and so on. That's so far our whole system. The long tweet service. Okay, that's our whole system. In UML, that's the system environment or system context diagram. Great. Yes, it's a bit more detailed now. Still it's easy to draw, easy to understand, but a bit more detailed. But now, now we can start working with that. Now we will see why I call this a software cell. Not just because there's this domain dot in the middle and there's a membrane surrounding it. Look at this. <coughs> Those software cells can divide. We can take this one software cell and divide it up. This here is a horizontal division because I'm drawing a horizontal line right here in the middle or, or through the middle of the software cell like this and I'm like cutting it apart. No, actually I'm drawing it apart. As you can see here, there's all the domain right here and now I'm drawing apart the domain and now after that, the domain is split across two software cells. That's a horizontal split. And this is much better than empty architecture. Why? Why would I do that? Why would I do split one
one software cell in such a way into two software cells? Well, the horizontal split is a technical split. It's because of technical reasons. It's because the technical reasons are driven by, well, we have to trace that back to some customer requirement, are driven by quality requirements. Why do you set up a client server system? Why don't you put everything on a, on a desktop? Why do, you, why do you divide it? Why do you distribute the system on two devices? Why do you do that? What's the requirement? Did the customer tell you, well, I want to I wanna run this on, on the server and the client, or on three servers, whatever? No, the customer doesn't, doesn't require a certain distribution of software, of code. Why do we do that? It's the same problem, but it's a multi-user system. It's a multi-user system, okay. Multi-user access to the same data might entail that we have to split it up, right. Okay, multi-user access. What else? Performance. Performance. Why would a system now running on two devices be faster than a system running on just one device? Price is not the reason. Pardon? Twice as much resources. Okay, could be. So we can do something in parallel, right? There's one CPU and another CPU could distribute the computation. Okay, it's performance. Another reason. Single responsibility Has any customer asked you, um, do you follow uh, the single responsibility principle in your code? <laughs> no, but that's not necessarily. Same responsibility is not a, a, a technical reason, not a quality reason. At least not the qualities the customer explicitly wants from you. It's very important. Yes, SRP is very important for evolvability. We're going to talk about that tomorrow in the workshop. But usually not, not very high on the priority list of the customer. Come on, another technical reason, another quality. Okay. One, two. Want to present on different channels? Maybe there's like some stuff we do the we do for all channels, and then there's here presenting it on desktop and on a mobile device. Desktop application, desktop application, mobile application. Yes. Okay. So it's different devices or, or user interface devices. Okay. Now that redundancy. Fine. Redundancy. Redundancy. Yes. Another requirement. Scalability. So it's performance for many, many, many more users, or many, many more data. Maybe security, something like sandboxing. Access to hardware. Maybe hardware is sitting over there, and we can't really connect the user PC to the hardware, so we need another, another device sitting next to the hardware. Okay, so there are several reasons we can why we want to split it up in a horizontal manner. Call that client and server, if you like. That's a technical split. What? What? Not technical reasons in it. Okay, so there are quality requirements who drive us to think about distributing our code base across several processes at least. So think of this, the software cells here, as processes or devices or even whole sites. This is running over there um, on parse.com. This is running over here in our own network. This is running over there on the, in the client's network and so on. So it's sites, devices, processes. Each software cell representing our in some process. And see how this is now different from the layout model? <coughs> Remember we, we had this um, picture in the beginning where we distributed the three layers onto three tiers? And we had two servers and one for the presentation layer code. How would we draw that now? We want to draw it like this. As a user, 
working on this software cell, this software cell knows that software cell, this software cell knows that software cell, and this software cell then knows the resource. What is this? This here in the middle. Is it functional layering? No, no layers within the software cell? No, I'm saying that we care about the functional decomposition of all sorts of things. Okay, this is still presentation main business tier, and this is the data tier, but still, look at this, what's in the middle of each of those tiers? A domain. Pardon? A domain. Domain, right. So now we don't have any difficulty saying, well, of course, on the presentation here, there's running some domain logic. It's right here. Very natural. Each of those tiers looks the same, very basic anatomy. It's a software cell, and this software cell has an environment and is used by some agent in the, from the environment, and it's using other stuff in the environment, and you see, each software cell has portals and providers, portal provider, portal provider, plus domain logic, domain logic, domain logic, whatever the domain is on that tier. So there's no problem distributing our domain logic and asking ourselves, okay, where should the validation be done? Should the validation be done right here? So no round trip to this tier necessary. Okay, let's do the validation here. No, move it here. Depending on what kind of thing, technology we're using. Maybe we don't want to get involved with JavaScript. So it's just plain HTML um, presented by the presentation here to some user. So whatever, he clicks a button, he sends some data, the data is passed down to maybe here and it's validated. Maybe it needs to be checked against the database. Okay, right. Maybe the data is validated here. Maybe the calculation we wanted to do in the database <coughs> up here, instead of learning some strange stock procedure language, we're using our main language, Ruby or Java or C Sharp, whatever. Now we can depict this. We couldn't do that before. Now it's not just in our heads, but we can visualize it. We can talk with other people about that. And this is technical technical division of software cells. And you can continue. You can continue doing that. You say, okay, let's focus on this one. What's this one supposed to do? And then you divide it up again, if you like. Maybe this splits into two, three, four more software cells doing different stuff for technical reasons. Why not? Maybe you put another software cell on the side of this one here because there's some other resource it's, it needs to use. Great. And you always know there needs to be a portal here, there needs to be a provider there. And because of that, because this is a separate entity, so to speak, it has its own, its own clock, it's its own socket, it's its own process. Because you know that, you also know that this one here, see, this transition, this dependency here, the communication going, flowing in, in both directions will be fucking expensive. Orders of magnitude more expensive than whatever is happening within here. If people had drawn this kind of diagrams at the end of the 1990s, CORBA, probably EJB, probably wouldn't have been invented because it would have been so clear that this here is so expensive. Don't try to use just a single chatty interface here. It needs to be chunky, it's so expensive. But for that, we need to visualize it, otherwise we, we don't feel it. It's like the difference between Newtonian physics and relativistic physics. If we had a, like a remote control car here, we would use this uh, small remote control with those sticks on it and we could drive it around, right? Very easy, we do it all the time at home with our kids fly around with it. a quadcopter, nice. And now think about those cars on the Mars. Is there someone at NASA sitting at a, at a panel, a remote control panel, and steering it with a stick? No, why not? 
Pin? Latency. Latency, right. Takes like, at worst, is this three minutes? Whatever. Minutes until the signal reaches Mars. Okay, look, there's this, this abyss. The, the, it's driving towards the edges. Okay, let's turn left. Okay, let's turn left. Three minutes later, well, well the aliens have already taken the, the soldier and all that was driving around. So it's not working. <laughs> High latency. You need to switch how you steer things. High latency. You need to switch how to use the other side. But we have to visualize that. Okay. So that's horizontal division. And we now know each of those parts, or tiers in this case, has at least three classes. One class, another class, another class. Here too, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's a very, very natural and basic division of labor within the overall software. And so this is, this is what, I, what I said before. Each, can you see this in small hearts? Each of those software cells has, has at least one heart within itself. Its own heart, it's, it lives, it has its own pace. It's at least on its own CPU thread. Maybe it's running on its own CPU core, on its own CPU device, whatever. So it has its own frequency of working. And that means it's autonomous. And how do you communicate between autonomous units, autonomous entities? How do you do that? How do we communicate with each other? Messages, right. It's messaging. And messaging is, in our world at least, asynchronous. If I'm asking you, could you please book me a flight? I'm not going to, if I was your boss. I wouldn't stand here and wait until you would book my flight. I'd go on with do my, my, my own business. And then you would send me a message, put me something, maybe a ticket in the inbox, say, that's your flight. So it's asynchronous. OK, this, is, this also becomes more apparent using this kind of this depiction. And here's the other division of software sets. So far we had the horizontal division, now it's the vertical division. See, I'm drawing a line top down through this software cell and pulling it apart so that this line here is on it. And then we have two software cells side by side. This is a non-technical division. Why would I divide the software cell of a whole system? Let's go back. Why would I divide our whole system Vertically. Because you identify two separate domains? It's two separate domains, <coughs> yes. Okay, if you're allowed, uh, alluding to the bounded context domains and domain redesign, yes, maybe. But let's make it a bit more simple, a bit more obvious here. Can you point at anything in this diagram that could prompt you to divide it vertically? Input and output. Input and output. No? <sighs> yes, different systems, mobile versus web versus desktop, maybe. Yes, but be more concrete. It's in here in the picture. Twitter. No? Twitter, Twitter, dividing the system to to make communication with Twitter easier is a technical concern. No, I'm looking for a non-technical concern. The users, right, the actors, they can prompt us to divide the system vertically and say, okay, we built our own system for the reader. It's its own software cell. And this maybe here is the software cell for the reader and it's accessing some kind of shared resource. And this resource is shared with the other software cell serving the writer and user. 
This one is web based, this one might be web based too, that's fine, so it's not a technical reason. But it could be different. Maybe we want to um, make it easy for the writer user to write long tweets with the iPhone app, Android app. Okay, but still, this guy here would need to be able to just click in, in any um, Twitter client on a link and see the, the long tweet. That would entail this is a web app. This could be different. So for usability reasons, for actor reasons, we would split up the system vertically. This again should and can be talked about with the product owner. Many product owners, many customers think, okay, I want this whole system and make it just like one, one piece. All should be delivered through the browser in our intranet. And you should get up and say, no, Let's think about it. Let's be more specific. Look at who's using the system. Let's ask ourselves, how can we deliver top usability, top user experience to the different types of users? And that could mean we take out part of desktop in a desktop application, and the other part is in, a, in an intranet application, or the admin gets the, the console application, the terminal with the window he likes. So yes. The vertical slicing, the vertical division of the scope <coughs> into different software sets is driven by users, is driven by increments. We'll talk about that later, uh, much more um, tomorrow in the workshop. Is this so, fine? the users uh, or the actors have different work in different subdomains? Do those users work in, in different subdomains? Maybe. So if you, if you can identify those subdomains, this one is like storage, then this is, is invoicing, then it's ordering shipping. ordering, shipping, whatever, yes. But that would go hand in hand, I guess. A certain type of user, actor, is assigned to a certain type of subdomain. Yes. Identify, maybe that's what you meant, identify subdomains, identify the roles representing those subdomains. And you think even in personas, you know, those personas, like you put a name on that, that's Peter, and he's 55, and has that kind of background, and work, has been working for 20 years in the company, da, da, da. So this is suggesting a certain user interface for Peter here, or Mary, she's 25, she's digital native. She certainly wants to interact with the system in a different way. Okay, yes. That's vertical division driven by, <coughs> by stuff the, the product owner understands. So talk with them. Talk with them because what you get here, this is an enabler. This gives you freedom. And this is not a technical reason why you split it up, but it's a user reason. It can lead, however, to technical benefits for you. What becomes easier if you split a system vertically like that? There's no quality reason. No? Performance doesn't improve, scalability doesn't improve, security, maybe security improves, yes. Because you, you deploy this to just users who are allowed to use it. No? Don't have to build in some security system. This gets Peter Paul. And they are allowed to do certain things, and this is what Mary gets. So, but it's, it's not really quality reasons. But you get freedom. You can deliver separately. You can deliver separately. And correct. Smaller systems. smaller systems. Smaller systems mean simpler, easier to maintain, availability is higher, yes. Correct. Plus, plus, you get the benefit of choosing a platform, if you like for each of those systems. See, the, the com least common denominator is the resource down here. Okay, but you can use um, Oracle from Ruby over here and Oracle from Java over here, if you like. So you have the chance to use the optimal platform or to be a polyglot programmer, a polyglot team. You don't have to get into microservices for that. There's still a vertical split. 
and choose the platform that's, that's the best fit. And this to depict it again. So here's a shared resource as different uh, devices, another different device, which is completely decoupled from the other stuff. That's fine, depending on the requirements. Why not? What does it mean? See, what we did now was we, we divided vertically. That's what you should do first. Talk to the product owner and see how you, how you can slice the system vertically. And for each slice, think about what's the quality requirements here, performance, scalability, security, da, 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 and so on. So you have vertical slices, and then you have horizontal slices. What you get is this. It's like a matrix. It's different software cells interacting with one another. I don't think you should call those microservices yet, but at least see each of this, those subsystems here has its own membrane, which means it has its own portals and providers and its own domain, and it needs to be in contact with those other software cells in an asynchronous, message-oriented manner because they are running on different threads or CPUs. That's all natural. And all with the same symbol. A simple, a very simple, very simple circle dividing the environment from, from whatever needs to be built by you. And it's the domain you know here, the membrane is structured in a certain way. It has certain layers. Okay, very easy. And the whole thing in the end, all those details, all those providers and, and providers and portals and so on, and all those software cells resulting from your decomposition. Take them as a checklist. Go around. Go around and ask for each and every element in this drawing. What do I need to know? What do I need to decide? What's the paradigm? What's the product? What's the technology? What's the API? That's what you said right in the beginning. Yes, ah, there's a Twitter API. And I asked, how do you like how do you visualize that? What's the context to that? Now we know. Now we can check them off. Let's go back. We can ask who's that? What kind of interface does he want? What kind of device should that run on? What's the performance criteria? We can ask that for this single actor, and for this one, and for this one. We can ask what's the API there? Do we know anything about it? Who's going to research it? Which kind of URL shot bar are we using? What's the API for that? And of course, while you're dividing the whole thing, you stumble across more resources, because one resource we certainly have forgotten so far. That's some kind of database here. The tweets have to be stored somewhere, because otherwise he's tweeting, or he's not just tweeting it, but He's writing it, but he can't read it. He clicks on a link, and where does the link lead? Okay, it needs to be pulled something from the database. Okay, what kind of database is it? What kind of paradigm? Is that a, a NoSQL document, or did it key value store, RDBMS? All those questions can be asked by just going through all those symbols and checking them off. Have we talked about that? What's the performance requirement? What's the, what's the data load? How many? How many tweets do we expect to store here for how long? What's the load on the URL shortener? Do we build it ourselves? Do we, do we use one that's already there? Just questions. Maybe sometimes they are easy to answer, sometimes they're difficult to answer. Okay, that's what I wanted to, to tell you. So 2005 software development, starting software development from specification was difficult for me, but then I, over the course of several years, I de developed this notion of the software cell, and it became easier, successively, each day a little bit easier. And nowadays, I, I, don't, whoever, I, I don't, don't hesitate. Whenever someone comes along with some specification, I know exactly what kind of questions to ask, what to do, and it's so easy. It's as easy as drawing the circle our system and let me be guided by this method. 
asking what's the environment, and then splitting it up, asking what's the quality reasons, asking what's the, the user reasons, the actor reasons for splitting it up vertically and horizontally. And I'd be very happy if that would make your developer life a little bit easier. Thank you.